At a time when U.S.-Israeli relationships are at a low point, we are extremely pleased to welcome to this breakfast program one of our nation's most skilled and wise Middle East experts, Dennis Ross. In his book entitled Doomed to Succeed, the U.S.-Israel Relationship from Truman to Obama, Mr. Ross provides an insightful history about the sometimes charged, occasionally strained, but always essential relationship between the United States and Israel. As someone who has been at the center of Middle East policymaking, working in the government for more than three decades, and having spent many of those years trying to negotiate a Middle East peace, Mr. Ross, more than anyone, has had a hand in shaping the U.S.-Israel partnership. He has worked closely with every Israeli prime minister since Yitzhak Shamir and understands what has driven our policy towards Israel and the region. Let me start with a, with a reality. In every administration, from Truman until today, there has been a constituency that looked at Israel as a problem, as a problem for the United States. Not as a partner, but as a problem for the United States. And that attitude, that mindset, has existed in every administration. The mindset that was embodied in those who viewed Israel as, a, as basically a problem, they were guided by three sets of assumptions. And these assumptions became very much embedded uh, in the national security bureaucracy. They really do go back to the Roosevelt time, and they're driven by a fundamental premise that association with Israel is costly. So there's three interrelated assumptions that this group has. I will say the third assumption is one that is shared by the countervailing constituency as well, but not to the same extent. The first assumption is for us to do well with the Arabs, we have to distance ourselves from Israel. You have to create a gap. If you create a gap, the Arabs will respond to you. The second assumption is, and it's a corollary, is that if you do things, if you cooperate with Israel, that will cost you with the Arabs. So obviously there's a relation between two. And the third is that if you could just make peace between Israelis and Palestinians in particular, then the American position in the, in the Middle East would be great. There'd be no problems. Everything would fall into place, not fall apart. So those three assumptions are embedded, and you see them existing in every administration up till today. One of the things I do in the book is to show that these assumptions were misguided, that they didn't reflect an understanding of the region. They didn't understand the priorities of those of the Arab states, the Arab leaders, and the like. To highlight this issue that, the, that you know, if you distance from Israel, you gain, there is a really striking example in March of 1970, we suspend, in the end of February, beginning of March, we suspend F-4 Phantoms to Israel. Nixon suspended armed shipments not as a penalty, but because he was trying to reach out to the Arabs. And he thought that if he did that, we'd get Arab responses. Now, the timing is really striking. Richard Nixon suspends armed shipments to the Israelis at the very moment that the Soviets are crossing a historic threshold. And that historic threshold is to send their military personnel outside of the block, outside of the Eastern Bloc. They send 10,000 personnel at the time, it goes up to 20,000, 10,000 personnel to basically take over the air defense of Egypt. And at the very moment that they're doing that, we suspend our shipments to the Israelis with the expectation that's going to gain us a benefit and the president sends his undersecretary of state, Joe Sisko, to Egypt to see Nasser saying, look, we did this, you know, pretty good, huh? You should, you should respond to us, right? And Nasser basically, how can I say this in diplomatese, he blows off <laughs> Sisko. He basically just says, forget it. Uh, so here we do this and we gain absolutely nothing from it. There are multiple examples of this, but I'm going to, I'm going to, Go to the second assumption, which was, OK, if we cooperate with Israel, we pay a terrible price. President Kennedy is the first president to break the taboo in providing arms to Israel. When he does it, he provides the Hawk anti-aircraft missile. 
And the Hawk anti-aircraft missile is a purely defensive system. It is good only against aircraft, right? Now, Israel has received no arms from us. I mean, the only arms that the, the Eisenhower administration, I, I should be very precise, we did provide 100 recoilless rifles to Israel during the Eisenhower administration. So this is the first weapon system that we provide to Israel, and it triggers an enormous controversy within the administration. Dean Rusk is the Secretary of State, and he says this will set a terrible precedent, and it will cause grave damage to our relations with the Arabs. Now, it's interesting that I'm here in New York making this, saying this, because the same day that the news of this arms sale came out happened to be the same day that Dean Rusk was meeting with the putative leader of Saudi Arabia. I say putative because he was the crown prince, Crown Prince Faisal. At the time, King Saud was, this is the son of Ibn Saud. King Saud is soon going to be replaced by Crown Prince Faisal. The same day that the news of this sale comes out is the same day that uh, they're meeting here in New York for the UNGA. And guess what Crown Prince Faisal is focused on? Is he concerned about the arms sale to Israel? Is this his preoccupation? Is this what he's raising because it's going to do grave damage to the relationship with the United States? No. What is he concerned about? He's concerned about the coup in Yemen because the coup in Yemen is backed by Nasser. And this is a mortal threat to the Saudis. And so that's, in fact, what he addresses. He's not concerned about the arms to Israel. He's concerned about the coup in Yemen. One week later, Crown Prince Faisal sees President Kennedy. And is he concerned about the sale of Hawk missiles to Israel? No. He is concerned about economic assistance to Egypt. He is concerned about our outreach to Egypt. He says our economic assistance to Egypt, which is providing at this time about two-thirds of Egypt's bread supply, he is concerned that this economic assistance is freeing up Egyptian resources to cause trouble in the region, change the balance of power in the region, and threaten Saudi Arabia. These arguments appear over and over and over again. And what do they reflect? They reflect that the priority of Arab leaders has been their security and their survival. Does Israel cause them problems? Sure. Do they like our relationship with Israel? No. Are they ever going to make their relationship with us contingent on what we do with Israel? No. You go through the history and you don't see that because they have a different set of priorities. You know, one of my professors was Malcolm Kerr. Uh, he was the dean of the Arab, American Arabs, and he wrote a book called The Arab Cold War. And he described the competition among them, how they would use the Palestinian issue not to solve it, but as a club to beat the other over the head with. It is the regional factors that threaten Arab leaders that is their preoccupation. When the United States is seen as the source of their security, they are never going to put that relationship at risk. And they don't. Now, they also have a strong need, given problems with legitimacy, never to look like they're completely dependent on us. The argument that, gee, if, you know, without the Israelis and the Palestinians, we could have a much bigger military presence there. No, because they'll have an American military presence when they think that it serves their immediate needs. You know, if you go and you look at King Fahad, after Iraq takes over Kuwait, he has to think about whether or not to accept American forces into Saudi Arabia. Does he raise the Israel issue with President George H.W. Bush when he raises it? No. But he doesn't want to know that we're going to leave. This is the one issue he wants to know, that we won't stay. And so George H.W. Bush promises we won't stay. The key to understanding our relationship with Arab leaders is to understand there's a frame within which those relations are always take place. There is a ceiling above which they'll never go, and there's a floor below which they won't drop. Good statecraft moves you closer to the ceiling. Our problems today with many of them relates to their perception of our reliability. It doesn't relate to what's going on with Israel, per se. The title of this book, notwithstanding the recent tensions that we've had over Iran. The fact is we've had many previous periods where the relationship between presidents and prime ministers was not, shall we say, golden. There were tensions between them. You know, I mean, George H.W. Bush, the only leader that he really personally disliked was Yitzhak Shamir because he felt that he you know, misled him, lied to him in his first private meeting. 
all these differences aside, the title of the book is called Doom to Succeed. It's not titled Doom to Succeed? Question mark. The reason for that is when you look at the trajectory of this relationship over time, it's been driven by shared values, shared interests, shared threat perceptions, those who threaten Israel always threaten the United States, and vice versa. And it's driven by something else now. One of the reasons I look at the future and I say, notwithstanding everything that's going on, look at the Middle East today. The state system itself is under assault. The character of the conflict that you see today is as atavistic and as fundamental as it can be because it's frequently over tribe, sect, and clan. And nothing is more basic than that. It makes the violence terrible because it's over issues like identity and who's going to define identity. Into this cauldron, you know, you have Israel. Israel has problems, for sure. But Israel has institutions. Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. Israel has a rule of law. It has regularly and unregularly scheduled elections where the loser accepts the outcome. It has a separation of powers. It has an independent <laughs> judiciary. It has freedom of speech. It has freedom of the press. It has a very vibrant civil society. It has a very remarkable artistic freedom. It has respect for women's rights and for gay rights. And there's no other state in the region that has that. That's what tends to bind us. That's what will continue to tend to bind us. And the contrast between Israel and the rest of the region is going to become more stark, not less so, in the coming years. We can have differences. We can have differences that we're seeing with the current administration and the current Israeli administration. <coughs> but it's unlikely to change the character of the relationship. My guess is that the next administration will move to, again, ensure that the trajectory continues on an upward path. And that's why, ultimately, the relationship while I say doomed to succeed implies an inevitability, you'll see in the concluding chapter where I talk about lessons from the past and implications for the future, if you're a believer in this relationship, there are some alarm bells, and you shouldn't be complacent, and you shouldn't take things for granted. It's very important for Israel to do certain things, which I outline in the last chapter. It's also important to be aware of those kinds of alarm bells. Israel should not become a partisan issue. If you look historically at the relationship, Israel has not been a Republican issue or a Democratic issue. It's been an American issue. The idea that Israel can be a partisan issue and that it won't damage Israel ignores, again, I think, what the reality is, particularly at a time, if you think about it, America is going to become a majority-minority country in, in 25 to 30 years, meaning Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans, and African Americans will make up the majority of the country those communities don't have a history of relations or connections to Israel. Uh, and that means that it's very important for Israel to retain its values. When I said share values, when I said it's the only democracy, it's very important for Israel to continue to embody those values. Very important for Israel not to become a partisan issue, given the changing character of the demographics here. Uh, and it's very important for Israel, in a sense, to be able to take initiatives at a time when there's a delegitimization movement. And one of the things I suggest in the last chapter is Israel should make its settlement policy consistent with a two-state outcome, meaning you only build on what you think is your state, not what would be the Palestinian state, as a way of also exposing the delegitimization movement. The boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement is able to hide its agenda, which is one state, not two states, because everybody focuses on settlements. If you could deny them that ability to hide who they are, it would make it much more difficult to foster the delegitimization movement. At the end of the day, however, still, notwithstanding everything I just said, Israel fundamentally is a democracy, is going to remain a democracy, and the contrast of Israel being who it is with what we see in the rest of the region for the next 10 to 20 years is going to continue to ensure a pathway that means the relationship will be doomed to succeed. And that's why I titled the book the way I did. So I'll stop there.
Hi, Warren Hogue, International Peace Institute. Uh, another assumption you were hinting at at the very end of your remarks is that to remain a democracy and to remain the Jewish state, uh, the, the two-state solution is the only pathway to that. Uh, towards the end of the election in Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu pretty much said, it won't happen on my watch. There are members of his cabinet who say it should never happen ever. So I have two questions. One is, have the Israelis given up on the two-state solution? And the other question is, is there another way? So let me take the second question first. No. <laughs> you probably want me to explain that. <laughs> no, there isn't. And by the way, I mean, there, the reason there isn't is because there are two national identities. Those who argue for one state, you know, I would suggest to you, look at the rest of the region. Show me one place where there's two separate identities that's at peace. This is a region that's characterized by terrible conflicts precisely because of what it's over identity. So you're going to try to, in a place where there's two national identities, think you're going to create what is one state and there's going to be anything but ongoing friction? Not a chance in the world. The larger question, which was the first thing you asked, the problem we face today is that both publics don't believe it. I mean, for me, for the last four years, I've been emphasizing the problem with this conflict right now is that of disbelief and it's only become worse. And every time you push an initiative that is designed to whole so solve the whole conflict and you fail, you only deepen the disbelief. We have to deal with the sources of disbelief. How do you get Israelis to look at the Palestinians and say, no, actually, they do accept two states. What is it the Palestinians would have to do to show we actually do believe in two states for two peoples? What is it the Israelis would have to show that they believe in two states for two peoples? You know, one of the things I suggested at the end of the nine-month period when Secretary Kerry's efforts failed was I actually made a suggestion, how about doing the following? Don't ever create the impression that our, our choices are either we solve the conflict or we do nothing. I, mean, that's, I have the same attitude when it comes to Syria. You know, we're going to put boots on the ground or we do nothing. When your approach is a binary choice where you're going to solve it or you're going to do nothing, you'll end up doing nothing. And then you create a vacuum. And in the Middle East, we see what happens. Vacuums get filled by the worst possible forces. What I suggested at the time, which was you know, the spring of 2014, Secretary Kerry should make it clear, I'm staying engaged. We're not walking away. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm prepared to try to solve the whole conflict, but this is what I require. I require each of the leaders to show they're prepared to take difficult decisions, because if I see they're prepared to take difficult decisions, <laughs> then I'll stay and I'll try to resolve the conflict with them. On the Israeli side, it means that the prime minister has to take on, basically, a constituency that wants to keep building settlements. And I'm not saying you have to stop settlements. I'm saying stop building settlements outside the blocks. Announce you're not going to build settlements outside the blocks. If you're prepared to do that on your side, what it means is you're prepared to do the hard things, and I'll stick with it. And with Abu Mazen, you say you're prepared to accept two states for two peoples, because you recognize there's two national movements. If you're prepared to say that, I know you're prepared to take on and make the hard, take on constituencies and take, make the hard decisions. Now, if you can't do that, if neither side is prepared to do that, then you say, you know, all right, I get it. You can't do the big things, so let's focus on the things you can do. Let's find ways to diffuse tensions. Let's find ways to improve the realities on the ground. Let's create coordinated unilateralism where parallel steps that can begin to show that each side is serious about creating coexistence will create a different reality for peacemaking later on. I'm Helena Finn, former US diplomat. Of course, we accept that the goal is the two-state solution. What about going back to people-to-people -people contact, in other words, working from the ground up? When I was at the embassy, we had the Y River grants. They came from the Clinton administration, but I oversaw them during the Bush administration. That contact, whether it was in emergency medicine, agriculture, water resources, education, meaning getting rid of negative stereotyping and so on, all of those areas put people together from both sides to work on common ground shared interests as opposed to putting them together to argue about their differences. Um, you know, look, I was always a deep believer in that in the, one of the annexes of the interim agreement had an annex exclusively devoted to people to people.
Today it sounds like an illusion because today it's only people-to-people -people fear. We need to get back to that. To push for it right now, again, it would look unrealistic. You're not going to convince anybody it would look like you're living on a different planet. So the, the problem is first you've got to diffuse the tension. One of the ways to diffuse the tension is you've got to stop the mythologies. Among the Palestinians right now, what's, what is on different websites and what has gone viral is this mythology that the Israelis are trying to turn the Al-Aqsa Mosque into the equivalent of what you have in Hebron, meaning you have Abraham's tomb and you have the Ibrahimi Mosque. It's not true, but it's being spread. Uh, and, and it's believed, and a lot of these kids are going out there and they're saying the reason they're doing this is that they're protecting Al-Aqsa. And, you know, if you spread incitement that way, then you're going to get this. A place to start is, I mean, I would like to see, Secretary Kerry was talking about going out there. I'd like to see him go to Oman. I'd like to see uh, King Abdullah host a meeting with Prime Minister Netanyahu and Abu Mazen. And I'd like Secretary Kerry to be there, and I'd like them to come out with public statements where the Prime Minister could say, we are not going to change the status quo, and Abu Mazen will say, they're not going to change the status quo. There's no truth to what's going on there. We have an assurance, and King Abdullah would say, you know, the Waqt is responsible for managing the Haram, and that's what it's going to be. You need something like that to counter this image right now. So you have to start by trying to counter what is, is the kind of uh, atmospherics right now that has mythologies easily believed and spread like wildfire. What I mean by restoring belief is, you know, if you say you're for two states, for two peoples, then have a manifestation that that's the case in terms of your words and your actions. Don't have actions that imply just the opposite. Uh, and you know, a couple years ago, I wrote a piece where I identified actually 16 parallel steps that could be taken. Unfortunately, everyone was able to restrain their enthusiasm for those suggestions, and they weren't taken. <laughs> but the fact is, had they been taken, you'd be in a very different place now. This is what I mean by focus on the things that you actually have a chance to do. Don't focus on big initiatives that have no chance of success right now. My name is Ann Phillips. I'm a board member of the International Peace Institute. Um, since Saudi Arabia and Iran are having this conflict, to say the least, competition, um, and there is such animosity towards Iran and from Iran towards Israel, the relationship of Israel and Saudi Arabia seems to have thawed somewhat. And I wonder what you feel the future of that relationship will be. Yeah, first of all, where the, where the Palestinian issue matters is in something like you're not going to get Arab states, including those that have peace with Israel, to be doing a lot overtly with Israel. There's a lot that goes on tacitly right now because there's converging interests, converging fears of Iranian threats, converging fears of radical Islamists. But the idea that you're going to get overt cooperation so long as the Palestinian issue is out there is not going to take place. And the reason is because that's still an issue that creates a sense of kind of historic injustice that has to be addressed. So if you really want to see something like that materialize, then you have to approach, you, you have to do something on the peace front. As I said, I don't want to push for big initiatives that are going to fail right now. If I, I mean, I would focus on first diffuse the tensions, then focus on steps on the ground that can begin to demonstrate each side can make commitments and fulfill them, even if the commitments are to us. Thirdly, then go to the Arabs after you've changed the climate. The Palestinians today are too weak to make peace. What I mean by that is, the political culture right now is so infused with a sense of victimhood and grievance and anger that the idea that you would rationalize making a concession towards the Israelis is seen as fully illegitimate. No Palestinian leader is going to embrace that. Now, you can't make peace if you can't make a, a compromise. So the question is, can the Arab states assume that responsibility for the Palestinians? Now, the reason that makes sense is because the Israelis today so disbelief the Palestinians, they're not going to make concessions towards the Palestinians unless they get something from the Arabs in return. So you need a kind of Arab umbrella. It's a kind of reversal of the paradigm for peacemaking. Because basically, since 1939, from 1939 to 1973, 
the Arabs assumed a kind of broader responsibility for the Palestinians, not because they tried to solve the conflict, but because they tried to use it for their own benefit. After 74, with the, at the Arab summit in Rabat, then the PLO became the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinians. And the Arab states said, okay, it's up to you to resolve your future, not us. Now, you need the Arab states to assume a responsibility again, but with the idea of peace in mind. Now, you know, if I were doing what I used to do, I wouldn't do this publicly. I'd privately go to the, the key Arabs, not now because this is the wrong time, other than to do what I was saying for diffusing tensions, like have a meeting in Amman. I would go and I would say, if you have an interest, what would you need from Israel to be able to assume the following responsibilities in terms of concessions for the Palestinians? And also, security responsibilities, security arrangements that will have to be part of any deal. And you say to the Israelis, what do you need from the Arabs to be able to make concessions on the Palestinian issue? And if it turns out that there is a potential there, then you pursue it. But you don't publicize it until you have it ready. You know, the idea of public initiatives, first of all, when you, when you go public, everybody has to assume their most extreme position because they're exposed. The essence of diplomacy is understanding how you create the circumstances and the political space to make hard decisions. The essence of diplomacy isn't putting others in a position where they have to explain themselves in more extreme terms because that's the reality. Well, I thank you very much for your sharing your experience and your knowledge and being synonymous with Middle East. Thank you. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.